Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast, a podcast about how to grow your business from one hundred thousand dollars and beyond. And beyond in the land of the rising sun. Welcome to the Scaling Japan podcast. I'm your host Tyson Batino, and on today's episode, we have Mar Schwartz. Mara has been researching for about a year on the challenges that startups in Japan face when doing market entry. He has wrote a well-known report on the state of market entry in Japan, and he will be sharing some of the insights with us. And we will link to his report in the show notes. And I have looked at this report, and I love it. I learned a lot about market entry and uh, a lot of the challenges that company faces, and why. But uh, Mar, could you give a short introduction, please? First of all, thank you very much for having me here. So, as you mentioned, my name is Maor. I live in Japan in the past three and a half years. In my background, I'm more focused on cybersecurity.、Uh, I served in the Israeli Defense Forces for seven years, and after that, working in a couple of different companies in Israel in the cybersecurity domain. Also gave a few talks in the conferences worldwide about that, and as you mentioned in the past year or so, I'm really focusing on better understanding the Japanese market and why it's such a unique business dynamic and everything around that. Yeah, no, your research has been a very big help in unlocking the mysteries, or at least I know there's a lot of people who may know these answers, but. There's never been a major attempt to make all this information publicly available. Yeah, actually, like finding the information on available online was also a difficult、uh, step when I started the research. So we first trying to understand what is out there, and when I try to understand like the challenges that different startups are actually experience here in Japan, unfortunately, there are not a lot of publication around that. So that's why I actually was focused on that topic. Awesome! And、uh, what actually made you interested in starting this one-year project, which will probably end up being two years long? But、uh, what、yeah. made you interested? <laughs> so I-, I will be honest here, right? So when I just moved to Japan, I thought that you know I'm coming from Israel, work with a bunch of like advanced companies in the cybersecurity domain. I know how like startup mentality. And I thought that I'm kind of、uh, yeah sure I know how things should actually behave or what the processes should be, and I I didn't mention that that but I work for Sampo Cybersecurity, which is like the second largest insurance company here in Japan, and they open a subsidiary that like focus on providing uh, uh, cybersecurity services and products to the local market. Under that umbrella, my role is actually working with the different vendors that are partners and communicate the, the Japanese market needs and to better understand the startup, like what they can do or not,、uh, to our clients. So I totally forgot to mention that. Sorry, but the reason I mentioned that it's because that thing actually started the process when the first two years I thought that I'm. I was arrogant enough to say that、oh, I know how things should go here in the Japanese market, but after two years of a lot of frustration, I said, "Okay, you don't understand the rules of the game." You might say, so you better just like shut up and listen and start exploring what is exactly going on here, and what are the challenges and how things are behaving. And it took me a year, better or worse, to understand the basic rules of the game. Let's put it that way. About to understand the, the business dynamics and how culture affect everything around that. So basically, my motivation was I want to improve while being here and employed in the Japanese companies and actually share the information or my knowledge with that journey. Yeah, and I think if people f- take your report seriously, you know, it could save a lot of money. But not only that, help companies whose services are needed in Japan actually succeed. Yeah, definitely. So、uh, before we jump into the super details, one of the things that I think after reading your report needs to be mentioned is setting a realistic expectation for market entry. And、uh, in your report, you had realistic market entry timeline and kind of like the stages involved. 
but could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So actually that from my own experience, again, working with traditional Japanese company here and working with Japanese companies in that magnitude had a lot of access to other big conglomerates. So being involved in all those processes, I was actually managed to identify how long the life cycles here in different aspects takes. And then I tried to implement that from the startup expectation. So usually when startups are entering a new market, they defined, you know, like a KPIs that uh, they're not really possible to get them here in Japan, because usually we will have three or four POCs in the first year, five, by the end of the year, we will have five paying clients. We will then we will have like six different sales channels and so on and so forth. And then when they don't set their expectation right here in Japan, they won't get the right resources or the breathing breath they need in order to actually succeed here in Japan. So from the way I saw that, I saw there are like four different phases. The first one, I called it like phase number zero. It's like finding a partner and open local offices. Usually that process alone can take a year. But let's say that afterwards we start in, in phase number one meaning we would like to do a market education and actually do a few POCs maybe. So that process alone take another year because the first year, again, you need to secure the partner and then the partner need to have the, all the materials, he need to, to do the training, he need to understand what's going on and then starting to test the technology by himself and educate the sell team, create their marketing materials and so on and so forth. It's an entire operation. And then they will try to actually get in touch with like a early adopters in the way the Japanese see that, meaning that it still take a year to convince them to actually do a POC and actually get just to get a meeting and to hear about that new service or new product. The market education phase will take another year or two before you actually see something happens in the Japanese market. After two years in the process, you're finally getting into the second or third year that you already operate here in Japan and you invested <laughs> a lot of money and so on and so forth. So only then you can actually gain like POCs, uh, a few sale partners maybe, and probably a few paying customers. And only then after three years or four years in the process, you can actually see the growth or the scale phase. And it's like really unique to Japan because in the US, for example, the entire thing takes a year, right? Because exactly. they're, <laughs> they talk the same language, they have the same culture, and it's not that hard to sell. There is a reason to it. There's like a lot of different layers why it takes so long to get growth or scale here in Japan. And I think we're going to touch a few of them in the next few minutes, basically. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's actually a three to five year plan, not a one year plan where let's say after six months, you'll go to growth and scale is kind of like what the expectations are. Oh, you hit... definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, they also underestimate finding a good local partner. Yeah, that's by itself is a challenge. Think about that from their perspective and you will see like how much resources do they have? If they're like startup in, in the domain that they would like to expand, do they have, do you have a competitors that they already work with? Definitely. It's not easy to find a partner and start the market entry basically. And when you do market entry, you want to find someone who's very good at the local market, who's available. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And let's say the best people are always uh, usually taken, but uh, not only that it's, can you find the person who can take a product from a Western market and adopt it to the Japanese market, get it into these channels, get trust from, let's say, the local consumers. I know a few people, but I can count them on my hands. <laughs> Definitely. And it's also the matter of like when the expectation phase, it's to understand who should actually put the resources to do that. Because later on, we will touch on a few things that actually will shift the burden on the startup and not the sales channel in most cases. We did spend a good amount of time, but it's just to get 
this one point, it's really a three to five year horizon. And it takes much longer than what it would you know, normally take in the United States. And I think that's probably the biggest great market entry people have when dealing with foreign corporations. And I think they waste a lot of time going back and forth because many companies are looking for shortcuts. Yeah. Then when they usually fail, generally speaking. Yeah. So next, I think we're going to move on to the cultural and business differences that affects market entry to Japan. So there are a lot of culture differences between Western world and Japanese business dynamics or culture in general. But a few of them I like uh, mapped or flagged as most relevant to business here in Japan. Usually I'm not talking about the more common things that like uh, on a business meeting, you need to bring your business card and do the exchange and all that ritual, but actually things that affect processes, decision-making processes or cell or life cycle processes and so on and so forth. And the one I flagged are basically the following. The first, the risk aversion of Japanese culture, the Japanese client, the obstacle of language, the supply chain here in Japan, and the partners network. Those are the overall topics. And I think that if we will deep dive into each one of them, we will see how it directly affects the business dynamics here in Japan. So let's talk about risk aversion. There's a Japanese saying that it's, it says like, knock on a stone bridge before crossing it. Meaning that even if everything seems legit and everything seems like without any risk, just double check. And that phrase is actually what the get us into the risk aversion part of the culture differences. And if we will take the business social responsibility here in Japan, and people not aware of that from like, again, Western worlds or roughly aware of that, there are a few interesting points about corporate Japan. So the first one is actually that businesses in Japan have an important role in supporting the social system. It's a big phrase, but if we'll try to break it down, so companies here are providing company housing and in addition, periodically recruiting new graduates in like every year from university, and then they train them by themselves and then position them in the role that the company uh, needs. So for example, if I'm a major in like arts, but then the company needs like a new sales person in the sales department or a new IT person. So they will actually recruit those graduates and train them for like six months, and then they just drop them whatever they need. So again, an art graduate can actually do an IT or like sales afterwards. So that's a very, very the way that businesses has like supporting system, sorry. And on top of that, we also have like permanent employment structure, meaning that people can work in the same company for life. And terminating an employee, it's almost impossible here in Japan. They need a lot of reasons over time in order to start to build the case. But honestly, it's almost impossible. So as a result that the social responsibility here is such a great pressure on the corporate Japan, so companies cannot take big risks. Thank you for listening to this episode of Scaling Japan. In addition to serving as your fine host, I also provide advisory and coaching services to business owners who want to 2x, 5x, and even 10x their business. So stop holding your company and your team and your employees back and let me help you and your company scale. Find more information at scalingyourcompany.com. Now back to the episode. That makes a lot of sense. Or meaning like maybe in the US, the company's biggest role is to its shareholders. Exactly. But in Japan, it's to your shareholders and society as well. Exactly. And I actually uh, will argue uh, a little bit that more through the society than the stakeholders or like shareholders in that case. And because of that, they, the way they see risk and evaluate risk is differently from Western countries. And where like, again, like let's take big corporations like Apple, they can take a very big risk bets in order to create, for example, the new Apple car. 
but here in Japan, it only can be incremented little by little in order to not take big risks. So that's the way that corporate Japan is like responsible or the power structure here in Japan regarding like society and corporations. But if you will take a deep dive to the, the way the processes work, we can see that, okay, so I will get like the module, the Kaizen module as an example. Kaizen is a very known process of like small increments in order to gain a big overall change over time. So I think that you, when you publish that podcast, you also can show that Kaizen like process or life cycle. Part of the Kaizen that most people are not aware of, it's the decision-making processes called Namanashi. And the whole concept of Namanashi is that you, you have a proposal, you work in a company and you want to change the company in a certain ways. So you have an idea and you want to uh, start the process of the change within the company. So what you do, first you identify the stakeholders that this change that you want to make will affect. The second thing is that you will take each one of them separately and talk with them in an unofficial way. Once they have their feedback in place, you will revert back to your original proposal change it and go to the next stakeholder. Eventually, after you went through the entire stakeholders list and you explain what you want to do and they give you the feedback, only then you will have this like official meeting when you're actually offered that change in public and all of the stakeholders will say, yeah, yeah, yeah of course, we, we, we know, we agree and so on and so forth. And therefore we are all responsible to that change. What it actually does, it's like taking off your responsibilities individual about like decision-making processes because we all agreed upon that change. So if something went wrong, there is no individual responsibility in a way. It's a group. The downside here is that, of course, everything takes a lot of time. So if you want to make a proposal or a change, that thing can take months to actually execute. But when they all agreed upon, so the execution part is usually fast. So think about that when trying to get uh, a new service or a new product within, uh, from outside, I mean, to Japan. So you need to go through that process when you have this like partner that you want to partner with and the person that you talk with need to do the namanashi inside the entire corporation basically in order to move forward. So from the startup perspective, as a former startup perspective, the decision-making processes in Japan are much, much longer than Western world. I think you made a very important point that it does take a lot of time to get the decision made, but once the decision has made, the execution is quick, everyone is committing to it. And it's part of, let's say, I'll say kind of like each department's execution timeline. And it's a key component of each department. Exactly. So now I've experienced the nemoashi to a probably a smaller scale where it's, you know, you just spend one week doing it instead of months. That was a key component. But once we finally got to that meeting, all the questions have been answered beforehand. That meeting is more to finalize the timeline. Yes, exactly. And also when, again, think about that as a startup that tried to enter a Japanese market, it's a big thing. It affects the entire partner resources. Eventually, partner, the local partner will offer that to their own clients. So they need to make sure they are 100% sure of the technology and so on and so forth. So that's why there's a lot of different stakeholders within internally in the, part, the potential partner company. The one that you engage with, you need to go to each one of the department and actually convince them offering that new service or a product that they want to embed into the company. And I've actually seen kind of the opposite happen with uh, friends where the decision process was made pretty quickly, but then the Japanese company, they didn't really communicate it well to their departments and the execution was really done poorly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Things like that might happen as well, for sure. (laughs) It was kind of funny, but it's it's probably the main point is like, but I mean, I do think the process that you outline 
applies a lot to big corporations. Uh, there's sometimes big corporations, maybe they might have a department that are more, let's say, uh, in, let's say entrepreneurs or like startup like, mm. and, uh, let's say if you're in that situation, be aware that if they do make an agreement very quickly or like faster than normal, uh, be cautious or be aware that the execution might not be as good as you would be hoping for. Oh yeah. I think it's kind of a red flag. Uh, if a big corporation like try to move forward fast, let's put it that way with like uh, a first time startup the first time they hear about or anything like that. So usually for me, it will be like a red flag. Yeah, for me as well, because like the, the doubts that it creates in my mind is like, does anyone else internally know about this? Or is it just, <laughs> is it just you making the decision? That's a good question to ask yourself if the process does go quickly. It's does this person have buy-in in the company? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, another aspect of uh, culture differences, I will say that it's called the Japanese client. That's how like I titled that. But uh, here in Japan, customer is a god. And there are two separate aspects or angles to that. The first one regarding risk, the company or the service or product provider, he can. It's not like he doesn't want to. He can't lose face. In Western countries, the losing face concept is not really a thing, but here in like East Asia, it's really important. Meaning that the company, they just can't be in a phase or a process or a spot where the client is criticizing them about the service quality or the product quality, because that will be a really damaging for their brand name. So the Japanese client has those two different angles. The first one that from the risk perspective, I just can't like have an unsatisfied client. And from the second perspective is that I want him to be very happy. So the customer is a God here and companies will do things that are not really common in Western countries, but here are perfectly normal. And another aspect to that companies has or have the responsibility to their clients it's not just their clients, it's also the network of partners and supply chain. So the definition of Japanese client is not just the end paying customer, it's just the entire ecosystem. Sometimes companies will actually prefer to avoid certain ventures if the risk of unhappy client exceeding the potential business opportunity here. And that come in with in different approaches. It can be from support, from the support perspective that the support had to be like very high end and can be in the way that the company would pro probably will prefer to offer a service and not just a product. Also in case of startups, if you are like supposed to be the expert in a certain area, so the end client might ask things that are relevant to the domain, but not directly to your service or product that you're trying to sell because you're an expert and you're part of that. So they will actually come in and ask you different questions or ask for different things. Here in Japan, it's more than uh, normal to actually try to help them, even though you're not trying to sell everything. And also it's coming into effect about pricing. So Japanese corporations looking at like a steady growth and small margin of profit and not trying to expand fast and charge more from their clients because they don't want to lose face and they want a an happy client. Like let's say getting the client is not for the purpose of achieving a short-term quarterly goal. A lot of times in the corporate realm, when they get a client, you know, this is in some cases, you're planning to work with this company for life. Exactly. Whole point is that we are here for the long term and you will be basically part of a new supply chain for the partner that you work with here in Japan. So they want to make sure that you're also like for real and you're here to stay. So that's an, another concept of why things takes a lot of time because you will come here now, you will knock on my door and I will wait for you to knock again in a six months or a year to see you're still alive, you still mature your, your product or service and you're into it to the long term. 
I think one of our previous guests, Bo, I think he mentioned when he was doing sales in Japan and overseas. In Japan, even when visiting corporations, when they would visit, they'll be treated very well. Like they'll be given tea, sit in a room, they could relax a bit, unwind, and then have the meeting. But when they met with a couple of corporations in the US, it was more like you have a 15 minute slot. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because everyone understands the life cycle here, right? If you are from a corporation perspective, again, you know that they need to do the entire Namanashi thing. It will take time, but we also need to create a partnership around that here and like individuals. So it also affects that. So that's about it. There are obstacle of language is another aspect of like culture differences. I would just like pinpoint up the things that I would like to highlight here. The first one is localization. If you are a startup that you want to get into the Japanese market, localization is everything. Usually foreign companies or Western companies that try to get into Japan, they don't fully utilizing that. And they said, yeah, we'll just like Google translate our like product or service and we'll try to do A, B and C and not take the hard long term like route. And usually it's like the number one uh, reason of like failure here in Japan. Supporting Japanese is super important as well. Japanese love to communicate in their own language. English is not acceptable here. And uh, sales and marketing materials, of course, had to also be reflected in Japanese as well. So when coming to Japan, the mindset and the resources should be everything in Japanese. Thanks for sharing. The next thing in line, it's actually the government as a market co coordinator. It's less known in Western countries, more common here. But basically here, the Japanese government has an important role in facilitating and coordinating between companies and new ventures. So sometimes, for example, there, it's like not on the table, it's more under the table, but it's very known here. For example, the Japanese government will say, okay, your conglomerate will focus on those initiatives and your company will do those things. And usually the competition here is not fierce and everyone try to work together. So actually I can jump from here to the partner network because it's also part of that concept. Here in Japan, there is a thing concept called like the partners network, meaning I'm client, I'm company number one, you're company number two, you have your own clients, I have my own clients, but I want to expand. I want to sell my products and services to your own clients. I won't go to them directly. I will actually connect to you and figure out how we can work together in order to achieve the maximum output for both of us. So we will have an agreement that like a revenue sharing or you will be a sales channel under me. But the concept here is that even if we are competitors, we will still cooperate from that perspective that I won't go directly to your clients and you won't go directly to my clients, but we will like sell through each other, the other one's services and products. So that concept is like one of the foundation of doing business here in Japan. Yeah, that was really interesting for me in that in some cases, if you get in with a large corporation and they trust your services, they believe in your services, they use your services they'll want to introduce you to maybe uh, their subsidiaries or clients and get a little bit of the cut of the action. Yeah, exactly. And on top of all of that, it's also the way that everyone profit from it eventually. It's the way to reduce risk in a way. So that's like the partnership network. Another interesting concept here about like business dynamic, it's the supply chain. And here in Japan, everything, like again, from the 90s or 80s or 70s even, it's everything is like complex supply chain woven deeply in the Japanese company. Usually it's like we're talking about like thousands of different companies that provide services and products. You're going up to the supply chain. And the concept here that I want to make is software or services or SaaS or whatever it's also part of the supply chain. And being a supply chain provider, it's a really tough task here in Japan. 
the company that you will be supplier to will want to know everything there is about your company because that's how it worked till today, basically, in the uh, traditional Japanese market. Toyota, just take them as an example, right? So Toyota know everything there is to know about the supplier from like how much they can manufacture and what timelines, the materials, uh, whatever the risk, the profit, the, everything. What I'm trying to say here is software is also part of that. But software has a different characteristics that are not aligned with traditional manufacturing. Software is super dynamic. It can change from day to day. But here in Japan, it doesn't work like that. Because if you're a supplier, you have to consult with me before you're making any change. So the entire cycle here of software is also very different. And usually companies that from abroad that are coming here to Japan are not aware of that. So every time you want to make a change, you have to communicate it up front. You need to tell them exactly what is going to do, how the change will look like, and so on and so forth. Have you ever found yourself having trouble creating a business plan? Do you pretty much operate on a day-to-day or week-to-week basis, creating confusion and chaos in your organization? If that sounds like you, I recommend you join my Entrepreneur Bootcamp. In my bootcamp, you will set an achievable but challenging revenue target for the current or following fiscal year, and we will create a business plan to make it a reality. See more in the show notes below. And now back to our episode. I think that's a good summary of Japanese culture in 15 minutes. And uh, yeah, I think for the podcast listeners, we've talked a lot about Japanese culture in our sales series. And we'll definitely dive into it more in this series on market entry as well. The next area I wanted to cover is prerequisites and, you know, the upfront investments needed from a startup to do market entry in Japan. This is actually a very interesting topic. Uh, It's going back to the same, like setting expectations. So there are different types of decision that the startup need to take in the strategic level and also in the tactic of how he's going to operate here in Japan. And everything that I'm going to mention here, the startup actually need to do before they actually start looking to partner with someone here in Japan. So there's a lot of resources that the startup need to invest and decisions that they need to take that upfront. And it's resource intensive, it's time consuming. It takes a lot of effort from the startup perspective or from any company that want to enter Japan. So I really recommend to be aware of that because that can set the tone on how to operate here in Japan and to better understand what you're getting into. Yeah, I do think this is a good one because I've seen a lot of foreign companies, it's like they have resources And sometimes they just hire a person as a country manager and they don't really give them money for marketing, for staff, and they expect them to do all of these things simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like setting expectation (laughs) about that, it's super important. You can't go, or you can, but you probably want the growth or scale or whatever. Honestly, when you come to Japan, you need to be aware that it's really resource consuming not just like from money wise, right? It's also like the focus on localization. You're like software engineers and your marketing materials and also sale changing prices, uh, management time and effort. So there's a whole subset of things that need to support the new market in general. But here in Japan, it's to the extreme, of course. Oh yeah, for sure. And I think in a lot of cases too, the person they hire as country manager, Usually they might be pretty good at sales. Let's say they've worked in a corporation for like five to 10 years, but a lot of times it's their first time, you know, dealing with what's say, what is a, essentially being the CEO or country manager in this case, it's a lot of times they don't have that, that experience. So they kind of jump into the job being like, yes, we're going to get it done. Then after like three to six months, it's like, oh, I'm really resource strapped. So yeah. I've seen that a lot of times and it's pretty funny to see. Yeah, it's very common, actually, but uh, maybe next time you will host me, we can talk about it as well. Choosing the right country manager here in Japan, it's also a challenge by itself. 
and I'm sure you you will have a podcast on that. Yes, we'll have a whole episode on just choosing the right country manager. Ah, definitely. I can see. I will listen to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, from everything regarding like prerequisite or upfront investment from the startups, there are a few things that is really worth mentioning. The market research is actually one of them. It seems that it's like, oh yeah, market research was the problem. So I know there are like a few companies that work here and that's basically it. So I don't need to know anything more than that. But as I mentioned before, Japan, everything here is localized. And it's very, very important to understand what your competitors actually did in that specific market. Because... If you will see how others interact with the Japanese market, if they're, you know, they don't do anything special and just offer the same products and services here in Japan as they offered that in the US, it's a bad example, but it's your very advantage point because you now have the tools and understanding that Japan had to have a localized services, product support, and so on and so forth. But if you see that some companies or competitors do different things here you need to understand why they do what they do it comes from like marketing the sales the pricing of their product or service how they set up the support what is the value proposition that they're trying to provide to their clients and of course more and more in my document my original document that i'm sure you will put a link here I set up like a few different questions that any company had to ask themselves when they dealing with market research. So what I'm trying to say here that market research is not just for the sake of it. You can actually learn how to utilize other experience or lack of experience to your advantage. On top of that, of course, it shows when you go to, to find a partner that you made your homework in a way and they will take you more seriously. They will actually see, ah, okay, he actually knows what he's talking about. He saw that they're working with that and that and what happened there and what their sales and what their pricing is. So market research is a very important step. And other things that I started kind of to mention a little bit about the supply chain that now that you are a partner with someone, you're actually providing them a service or products or whatever. So you're part of their supply chain. And because you're in their supply chain, they need to know things before the startup or the foreign company execute them abroad. For example, when we're talking about marketing and sale materials, those startups or foreign companies, they have other markets that they operate in. And they usually provide their like marketing materials. They have like sales materials from a new uh, services to use cases to everything you can think of. But your partners here in Japan, they rely on you to generate the marketing materials because you are the expert. It's your company. So the startup need to send the marketing and sell materials ahead of time to the Japanese partner so they can actually study them, they can translate them, and they can start uh, marketing them in their own channels. If they are published abroad before they publish in Japan, and some end client will approach the partner and the partner will be caught not knowing what you're talking about, they basically lost face in front of their client. So from their perspective, it's a risk. And from your perspective as a startup owner, you want to decrease that risk and show the part the, the procedures or the process is already in place. So you don't have to be worried about before we actually start talking with like finding the right partner, that's a thing that my company already implemented. So it gives me the advantage for the other side to show him how much I understand the market, how much I'm willing to reduce the risk, and the processes are already in place. So marketing and sell materials is only one level. The second level of that, or the second layer of that, it's actually new version release. Again, I'm talking broadly here. We're talking about like software-based companies. And as I mentioned before, software is extremely dynamic. 
but again, updates about upcoming changes in the products are a crucial things to update the, the potential partner in front, in, in, in upfront. And you also need to go over the changes before the release with him in order to make sure he understand everything so he won't lose face with their clients. The third layer in, it's like the most abstract one, it's basically the R&D pipeline, just to be transparent about which changes are going to be there and which are not. And again, it's part of the ecosystem that you want to show to the, your potential client that you created the processes and procedures to support his efforts in the Japanese market. And another aspect, of course, about like the upfront investment, it's the localization. As I mentioned before, Japanese has different needs. It has to be in Japanese. It has to be in the correct Japanese. So if you think that ah, I can hire someone that is not from Japan to do that translation work, no, there are nuances here. And you want to make sure that local people that are expert in that specific domain will do the translation will show you how it's done here, how other companies uh, localize their products and services in order to make sure that you are giving the maximum value to the Japanese clients. Another aspect of localization is the support. In Japan, the support offered sometimes is more important than the service or product itself. The support is everything here, from time to answer to how much the support is available from like ticketing, emails, how much they can uh, consult and everything like that. And of course, the reason that Japanese language support is such as an important uh, part of the service is of course, avoid embarrassment, avoid the risk that someone is not communicating uh, something that is really needed and you don't want to lose face as part of that as well. Yeah, definitely no surprises. Yeah. Another aspect, of course, is like wrap your product with a service package. Again, selling products by themselves here in Japan is less common. Usually it's come with a service. I can get into it. Why? Because the IT system here, but I think we don't have time for that. But I'll just try briefly to do that. Most companies here in Japan outsource everything they can that it's outside of the core business structure. So if your service or product is not in their core, core business, probably there is another company that will do the work or manage that specific product. Because of that, the way that the sales structure go through or the life cycle here is that your company or your partner will approach the end client the end client need to buy that product, but it will be operated by a different company. So in order to save time and make sure that the end client utilized your service or product to the, to the maximum, you actually had to offer a service because you don't want to count on a third party to do the work for you and provide them the value that you hope they will achieve. So in order to bypass the entire thing, just offer a service up front, then probably you can serve them the best you can. The last one is operations and regulations. Sometimes or a different domain require different licenses. Foreign companies think that if they will find a partner here in Japan, they will help them achieve those regulations or licenses that they need especially in the fintech world or uh, in also like energy. So I'm sorry to disappoint you, but if you want to operate in Japan, you have to obtain the license yourself. There is not a lot of a uh, percentage of Japanese companies that will be willing to do that service for you. Even if you are a partner or they want to partner with you, they will tell you, listen, we are not an expert in this specific regulation or we don't have the resources to do that. If you want to partner with us, please obtain the license upfront and then let's meet again. Gotcha, that, that makes sense. Yeah, and I think that's about it, to be honest. We covered about 30 pages or 30 slides out of, I think the whole research report is, I think maybe three to four times bigger. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a 160 something slides. Gotcha. So it's actually five times bigger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the reason I wanted to get you on is to provide kind of a good starting point on market entry, because even a topic like market research, hiring the right country manager, doing distribution correctly, I should have clarified earlier, but POC means proof of concept. So meaning the service or product that you want to launch in Japan actually works. And I think all of these in itself, they're one episode topics. This was a good overview before we dive in deep to each topic. And I think you did a good job. Thank you very much for that. And honestly, thank you very much for having me. I'm really a big fan. So it's a really nice opportunity for me to thank you as well. And uh, I hope you will have me around again sometime soon. Yeah, I look forward to hearing uh, your next project. I will be posting a link to this report in the show notes as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope I, uh, I helped. It was a big help and uh, I will need to reread your report. I learned a lot and it's one of those things you need to read four times. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Take easy, Mar. Thank you. Thank you very much.